What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to a brand fresh new episode of Homebrewed Christianity. Of course, it may not actually be fresh because the podcast is pretty cool because you can download it and listen to it whenever you want. You get the idea. It's really fresh now that I'm recording this intro. Uh, anyway, we want to bring you the best audiological ingredients so that you can brew your own faith. And today on the podcast, this is this is a, 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 a new moment because uh, Brad Artson's on the podcast. Not only is is Brad Artson a uh, process theologian, which I'm sure you're, you're surprised that we would have one on the podcast because I've read on the internet that process theology is just dangerous. But uh, Brad Artson's also a rabbi. And he, he is, uh, he's got his own podcast. So um, I'm going to link to it, or you can just type in Brad Artson on the internet. Art, son. Um, he is the... Uh, uh, he, he runs this uh, like, uh, commentary podcast that uh, engages... Um, kind of commentary on political issues that his students ask questions about or it could be like engaging questions around Torah or the different um, festivals of uh, uh, of the Jewish liturgical year, uh, all kinds of different things on his podcast. I listen to it like every episode, so I feel like he's my rabbi. I'm his podrishner, um, and I, I was just so, so thrilled to get to talk to him. Um, in, in the podcast, you'll see why. Like... He's just a rather amazing, awesome person, and uh, he is uh, at the uh, American Jewish University, um, and he's in charge of the uh, Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies there, which is right here in Los Angeles, California, and he has a brand new book that just came out, Renewing the Process of Creation, which, you know, if you want to know what a Jewish theological process take on the doctrine of creation is then you better hop on it if that wasn't good enough he also has a book god of becoming in relationship which is like an introduction to process theology um and and he has other stuff too but just go listen to his podcast i'll put links to all this on the on the page uh because because i'm just i'm just really thrilled he's on the podcast um before before we jump in i just want to tell you all um where where I'm going to be in the near future so that if you're going to be there, you let me know and we can hang out. Like, who knows? You uh, may be up in Berkeley uh, February 4th and I'm going to be at the Graduate Theological Union's live podcast. Or you're going to be in Dallas February 17th through the 20th at PYM and the pregame at SMU with York Rieger. Uh, you might want to come out here to Redondo Beach for Unfolding Theology the first week of March, the first through the fifth, if you use the homebrewed code and get two extra days with Jack Caputo and Peter Rollins. Details on the website. Or you might want to see me when I'm in North Carolina and sh- at Charlotte uh, at Myers Park Baptist Church in April 15th through the 17th. There are other uh, possibilities uh, in-, in the near future, and I'm always ready, interested, and excited. To, uh, to, to schedule other dates, to get to come speak, do a live podcast or whatnot for any of you. Um, when we're uh, thinking thinking about uh, uh, just just uh, the doctrine of God and process theology in, in this episode and the relationship between it um, and in the Christian expression of process thought, I think you'll see tons of like overlap and you'll also see uh, different insights that are gained simply by um, you know inheriting the wisdom and trajectory of a different tradition. So it, it's, it's a complete joy uh, for Brad to be on the podcast and I, I really think really think you're going to enjoy it. Um, after the episode, make sure you go share it with your friends like tweet it, share it on Facebook. Uh, leave me a message on Speakpipe. Tell me what you think about it. And because uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, y'all giving some such positive feedback. Brad wants to come back on, and I don't even know if it's in the podcast itself. But I told him that I have a goal. A goal for 2016 is to do a live podcast in Los Angeles with him and John Cobb at the same time. Yeah. See, everyone has to set goals. This is one. And he's like, that's awesome. And I was like, yeah, because you're a faniac. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a faniac for John Cobb. He didn't know the song, and I didn't teach it to him. This was our first time talking. But next time we will. Fania! Fania! John Cobb. Like that. Uh, anyway, uh, go to homebrewedchristianity.com. You'll find details to all the places I'm going to be, uh, how to invite me, how to connect on social media, uh, give lots of feedback. Um, you'll also find out about the little giveaway this Christmas. 
called Give the Gift of Jesus for everyone that you give my book to. You send me the info about it to bonus at tripfloor.com. You get entered in a giveaway for over $400 of theology books, and then you, your friends, your family, maybe your favorite fundamentalist you give my book to. We'll all get to participate in an online video interactive book club for Frizzy, which is similar to free, except it's a video book club on the internet. Yep. All right. Rabbi. Brad. In your earbuds. Boom. I am I am so excited to talk to you because um as a even though I'm an ordained Protestant minister, I listen to your uh podcast talking to rabbis about becoming a rabbi more uh-huh. frequently than any of my ministers who post their sermons. <laughs> so I like to think of you I'm I'm one of your podrishioners. How nice. Well, that's great. I'm happy to be one of your rabbis. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so uh, as we jump into the conversation, um, I want everyone to know up front that uh, even if we're in uh, in different religions, we have something really, really uh, strong in common, and that that is uh, our love for process philosophy and its ability to articulate um, the God world relationship and faith and religion and spirituality that uh, Abraham's people um, tend to resonate with. So, uh, as we jump in, I think, uh, for our podcast, which has had like every popular process person on it that you can think of, of every different variety of process thought from like the, the real more analytical side to the post-structuralist process friendly side to Catholic to Protestant to Quaker, all that. Um, I would love to hear your story as to how you, uh, became a, um, uh, a Jewish, a uh, trainer of rabbis, theologians, and found process thought. Um, sure. That way, I, I've listened to so many of your podcasts. I would mostly just like to say things to get you to say stuff, but I'm gonna try to avoid that and just tell everyone <laughs> they should listen to it. Though the sure. I cried while doing dishes when on your six remembrance uh, talk. Oh, thank you. It was powerful. I was like, "Geez, why don't we thank have you. this in the lectionary?" Thank you. But uh, anyway, so tell tell us your story. All right. So my story trip is that um, I grew up an atheist in San Francisco Mm -hmm. and uh, San Francisco happens to be one of the best places in the world to grow up an atheist because there's lots of great things to do. Um, And uh, and that was fine, you know, very identified as a Jew, um, but it was a cultural thing and it was a somewhat ethnic thing. All of my close friends growing up were uh, Christians of one sort or another or just Gentiles, uh, not of a Christian variety. Um, and I'm on it. Um, that's the redundancy of efficiency. Amen. Uh, so, um, so I, um, in college, um, I fell in love with God and, um, and was very nervous about that. Because I was, you know, from a lefty atheist family in San Francisco, and um, uh, I went to talk to the rabbi, and he said, I, I, and frankly motivated by, I had two fundamentalist Christian roommates who are among the sweetest people I've ever met, just kind, decent people, and their faith was so intrinsic to who they were that it made me open to it. Honestly, I couldn't entertain the story that they told. But but I wanted to explore somehow, so so I went to talk to the rabbi, and he said, "There's no neutral place to think about God from. You try it out, and you see how it works." And so he got me to agree to go to Shabbat services, Sabbath services, every Saturday for two months. And he gave me a book of Franz Rosenzweig, who was a German Jewish theologian, mm-hmm. who himself kind of returned from the periphery to the center. Was it Star of Redemption? <laughs> well, no, thank God. That's an unreadable book, even in the original German. Oh, um, well. the, if you it, go to the right answer. PhD program, you get tortured through it, and then you learn to love it. It's like the it, Jewish Karl Barth. Correct. It, he is indeed, that's exactly who he is. And I also came to Judaism through Rosenzweig. Um, there's an anthology of his work by Professor Nahum Glatzer mm-hmm. <clears throat> called Franz Rosenzweig, His Time and Works. And it turns out Glatzer has anthologized all the parts of Rosenzweig worth reading. Um, so saves a lot of wear and tear. Anyway, <clears throat> um, I had not planned on going into religion. I, I planned on 
as my love of Judaism and uh, and religion grew, I was still planning to be a politician. And so I was president of the Harvard Democrats, and I worked for the ACLU, and I interned for Alan Cranston, who was the senator from California, and I uh, was an LBJ intern in Congress for Congressman Burton. And um, and then my junior year, I interned for Willie Brown, who was the assemblyman from San Francisco. He became Speaker of the Assembly, and he offered me a job for when I graduated, and he offered to pay me retroactively. Um, so I went back to Harvard for my last year, knowing what I would be doing afterwards. And I spent two years being a legislative aide and realized I couldn't live that life. Mm-hmm. Um, I couldn't trust anybody. I had to assume people were there to use me for whatever purposes they wanted to use me for. He was out every night of, of every day of every week. Um, and I just saw that I couldn't live the kind of personal life I would want to live and be a politician. So my then girlfriend, uh, now 32 years later wife, said, you should go to rabbinical school since that's what you were wanting to do after you retired. Mm-hmm. I did, went to five years of rabbinical school, pulpit in California. Here come the process stuff is coming. Um, and uh, we had twins, Jacob and Shira. And it turns out that Jacob is severely autistic. And that threw me for a religious loop. Like, how could that happen? Here I am doing good things and serving the Lord and um, preaching the word and, you know, helping others. And then I get this son who has got such a massive struggle. Mm -hmm. So I spent two years not really talking to God. Turns out that uh, the American rabbinate is a fairly good place to be if you want to not talk to God. Um, (laughs) No one really noticed. Um, And then then I decided to deal with it by starting to read science again. And science was a childhood love of mine. And uh, I talked to Uh, Rabbi David Ellenson, who was a professor at Hebrew Union College Reform Institution in L.A. and New York, and asked him if I could do a doctorate that would be kind of a pull-it-all-together doctorate. I said, I'm not interested in a footnoted edition of someone else's work. I'm interested in asking the big questions, how does the universe work, how could this happen, and make sense of it. So I started reading cognitive biology, neurobiology, Darwinian evolution, um, astronomy and cosmogony, looking at relativity theories and physics and quantum and stuff. And, you know, the areas that people who are religious tend to focus on when they do science. Um, And and I I, I joke with people that I invented process theology because I did. Like I came up with this process dynamic view of the world based on the science I was reading. And then imagine my surprise and shock to discover that Whitehead had beat me to it by 100 years. (laughs) <laughs> but but truthfully, his prose is so dense and the process people are so bad at PR that no Jew knows about them, or at least knew about them. So I spent, I, I, I once I discovered there were people out there who were like my spiritual brothers and sisters, I reached out to them. They are, I will tell you, the nicest group of people I've ever encountered. Incredibly welcoming, remarkably lacking in ego, they really brought me in as a brother. I, I am continually amazed by their grace and their openness. Um, but it fit. I mean, it, you know, it, it, to, here it fit to the extent that when I go out in the world and I give process talks, um, one of the differences between Jewish process and Christian process is that Christian process people tend to feel marginalized and beat up. Um, and I'm the head of one of the largest denominations in the Jewish world. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm one of the heads. And um, and my book on process theology was co-published by my denomination. So, you know, to the contrary, Jews long ago, I think, other than Orthodox Jews, walked away from an all-powerful, all-controlling vision of God. It's and alien. Would you say that, like, part of the reason it was easier to walk away is um, – uh, is part of how Jews do theology methodologically? Or is there kind of a different dialogue partner, way of engaging the scriptures or something that makes... Yes, there is. I mean, it's two differences. One, um, Christians, I don't think, have something like our Midrash. Mm-hmm. Right? So Midrash is rabbinic stories about the Bible. We fill in holes all the time. You know, it says that Abraham is... 
in Ur, and then all of a sudden he leaves for Haran, and and the Bible doesn't say why, but boy, the rabbis do, and they tell this amazing story about he his father owned an idol shop, and then the big, you know, so like there's a whole big drama, and they don't have any problem making up a legend and filling it in, and that becomes sacred for us, mm-hmm. like itself becomes revelatory. And it's an ongoing open-ended process in which what the Bible means religiously is what the most recent authorities interpret it to mean, regardless of what previous interpreters have meant by it. And, and you say that, and you're also a conservative Jew. So, like, right now the progressive Christians are like, yeah, we really need more Midrash. This sounds great. Now, if you're yeah. Jewish, this isn't, um, this isn't like uh, uh, an intellectual funny business to get around the Bible. This is just what it means to take it seriously. Correct. So look, the way the way I would encourage Christians to consider thinking about it is there are different layers in Jewish understanding for what the Bible means, mm-hmm. right? The pshat is the contextual meaning of the Bible. That's what ancient Near Eastern scholars study, mm-hmm. right? And you certainly want to know what does the Bible mean in its ancient Near Eastern context. But that's an entirely different question than what is the Lord saying to me through this book? Mm-hmm. And for that, that's the level of Midrash, which is how does how do I bridge the gap between the Bible as book and the community's life as it's lived? And that is a dynamic process where it's going to translate differently for every generation and every location, right? Which means that, um, you know, a, a group of Jews living in Morocco, they will do a t- different kind of midrash to make the Torah relevant to their community. Um, and, and, Frankly, a, a reform community down the road from me will do Midrash a little bit differently than my conservative community because their community is a little bit different. And that's as it should be. That's how the Bible stays a living document. It can't mm-hmm. mean just one thing for all time. That's part of the bad metaphysics that process liberated me from. Yeah, definitely. So so how did this kind of uh, d- d- discovery of the faith um uh, Jewish faith and then kind of uh, process engagement with scripture and in the tradition uh, help you answer the questions uh, that, that sparked the whole thing. How did uh, your relationship with your children and, sure. and, and things, how did uh, that journey kind of play out personally? So, so for me, there were a couple liberatory moments. One was I was walking in Jerusalem and I remember looking up at the sky and realizing the bully wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. Like there wasn't someone who was punishing me. There wasn't someone who was punishing my son. There was just a great big cosmic heart. And, and what I felt was the love and, um, and a passion and a hunger for justice. And, you know, what process taught me was that God is self-surpassing. And so our job is to be self-surpassing too. And that meaning is found only in the context of relationships. Mm -hmm. So that enabled me to redouble my efforts with my son and for him to be open to feel my presence and not to think about, you know, what kind of a child I was robbed of, but rather to think my son has one of the biggest souls of anyone I know. And to miss that would be, that would be a sin. Um, so God stopped being the one who gave him autism or the one who allowed him to have autism. And God became the one who was, even in his autism, never walking away and always giving Jacob the lure to be self-surpassing. And my son um, is, you know, the culmination of that was two years ago, he walked across the stage and picked up his high school diploma, Mm -hmm. you know, and he got a a state high school diploma, which none of his experts, none of his therapists, certainly none of the educators had ever said would have been possible. Yeah. But it just broke the barriers. Um, And Jacob has said to me, I mean, by said, I mean, he, he uses facilitated communication. So he, he needs assistance with typing. Um, but he, with typing, he can say very sophisticated things. Your listeners might want to go online and Google Jacob Artson. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has some amazing essays out there. Amazing. Um, but he has often typed that process theology is what saved him, that it gave, he loves Torah and he loves God. Um, and, you know, it's hard not when he was younger, he would say, why did God do this to me? And, you know, does God hate me? 
And and I remember once he was listening to a talk I gave on process theology to a large adult audience. And when the talk was wrapping up, he came in the room and he pulled out his keyboard and he typed for me, Abba, if what you say is true, then it means God didn't give me autism. And I said, no, God didn't give you autism. And he said, but it also means that God is working with me so that I can overcome my autism. And I said, that's right, Jacob. You need to listen for the lure, and then you need to not give up on yourself because God will never give up on you. And Jacob typed, okay, I need to go think about that. And he wandered outside. But he's told me since then that that's what allowed him to keep living. Mm -hmm. And I hear that all the time. You know, I speak to Jewish audiences, general audiences around the country, and there's always some little old person with numbers tattooed on their arms who comes up to me at the end of a talk and says, you're the first rabbi I could really listen to. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's because for the first time, God didn't cause the Holocaust. God didn't abandon their families. Mm -hmm. Right. It opens up a possibility of entering into relationship that they didn't have before. Yeah. Can, uh, can you say a bit about uh, that in general? Because the Holocaust or theology after Auschwitz and this type of thinking in Christian thought has been um, maybe what prodded large amounts of Christian theology other than process to kind of recognize the pathos of God in the scriptures, uh, yeah. God's uh, ability to suffer and share things with us uh, and that kind of thing. If if you are a, a Christian minister or, or intellectual and you've been having this conversation, what kind of advice would you give to us to hear how uh, the Jewish community reflects on it and be able to articulate those insights uh, with, um, you know, in your own voice versus like us kind of taking sure. a tragedy sure. and appropriating it for our, for our own conversation? Look, it's kind of paradoxical. Um because Judaism, I think, truly has a more abstract concept of God as God is ontologically, you know, because you guys have someone who actually came to came to the flesh. Mm -hmm. So it, you, it would always, it always looks to me weird because I would think if I were a Christian, um, having a personal relationship through Jesus would automatically set me in the direction of relationship and of living within time and not this kind of cosmic Christ. I've always found him a little cold and off-putting. Um, so it's funny that Christianity made the kind of uh, imperial choice for the more abstract, whereas the Jewish God has always been in exile with us. Yeah. You know? and, and from the Bible on, um, both the Bible, the prophets of Israel, the rabbis of the Talmud, the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, they all talk about Shekhinah, God's indwelling female presence, having gone into exile with us. Mm -hmm. And that, that in a sense, God is roaming the earth as a wanderer along with the Jewish people. So um, I do think returning to the biblical roots, both of... Um, ancient Israel, but also of the Gospels, um, is what Christians need to do to return to a more relational understanding. Um, that, you know, it really is about how do you treat the widow? and How do you, do you see the Samaritan who's on the road? And do you, how do you treat the prostitute? You know, th those are the examples from your scripture that I think cry out for a processy kind of explanation mm -hmm. and resist the imperialization of Christianity. Yeah. So how do, um, one of the things I'm always fascinated by when, and listening, uh, to your podcast and, uh, and, uh, your first book, the one, uh, God of becoming God of relationship. God of becoming in relationship. Yeah. Um, is this, uh, this joy uh, that's super inclusive about just telling these hyper particular things about sure. the Jewish faith. Sure. Uh, I think that one of the things Christians and the church need to learn in a more post Christendom context is how um, we are a rather odd, peculiar people. And as opposed to trying to uh, make deflationary statements about what makes us unique uh, right. and make our community acceptable culturally, we need to uh, go take an ecclesiology class from um, 
from from you so we can learn what is it like to value and lovingly articulate the particularities of your tradition deeply. So can can you say a bit about what it means? Yeah, Trip. look, it, it, it seems pretty clear to me, and, and I have the benefit of being an insider-outsider in this culture. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I grew up very assimilated. My friends were all just... Gentiles. I went to Harvard. I'm as American as they come, but always American with a difference because I'm Jewish. Yeah. So, um, so that gives me a place to look in and out. And part of what I would say it, to your listeners is the only real universalism is particular, mm-hmm. and the only real particularism is universal. So, so once you start off by saying, you know, we are the universal church, and you mean by that everyone has to be like us. Right, ours is the only real faith, and then you've you've become highly particularistic because everyone has to be like you. Yeah. Right. Um, the only real universalism is to say there are lots of ways to solve this problem, and all of them are valid paths of wisdom. And I love the fact that we live in a time where more and more people are recognizing that. You know, I have a public figure Facebook page. Mm-hmm. Um, which I'd encourage your your listeners to sign up for. You have to like it to be on it. And, um, and we'll uh, link it on the blog post attached to this interview. So if you're looking for it, you can go there or just type in Brad Artson, which is art followed by son with no space. Type, you type in, uh, go to facebook.com and type in Rabbi Artson. Oh, Rabbi Artson. Okay. Right. So, so that'll get you. Uh, but there are th- over 30,000 people, most of whom are not Jewish. And every day I put some wisdom that comes from the Jewish tradition, but pertains to humanity. Mm-hmm. Right. Because I, I think we live in an age in which there's world wisdom, but it's not reducible to a single flow. Yeah. And, and it's because we can then enjoy each other's distinctiveness. Right. I don't learn from Christianity where it's just like Judaism, because that's the part I don't need Christianity for. Mm-hmm. What I need Christianity for are the places where it has a different perspective. And then I can do one of any number of things. I can either say, oh, why don't I think that? And then that helps me to understand better why I don't. Or I might say, you know, that's a really good idea. I'm going to now go back to my tradition and see if I can find it in there. And sometimes armed with that new vision you do, but sometimes you don't. And then you say, okay, I need to make that Jewish. You know, I need to make it so that a generation from now, that doesn't sound exclusively Christian because it's a darn good idea. You know, so lots of Jews in America today meditate or do yoga um, because honestly, Jews and Christians don't really have an embodied tradition. We kind of let that go in the medieval period. And we have what to learn from the Eastern traditions about living in our bodies And frankly, about listening in silence, Um, you know, but those are things that can become compatible and Jewish. They just are going to take a couple generations to work through. Yeah, Um, it will. That even makes me think of, I I guess it was a year or two ago, uh, you know, listening to podcasts, you never know when they are unless you're sitting looking at the date. But it's completely fascinating to me. Um, a, a leader in your denomination r- training rabbis and you decide to have a Zohar reading group of something you haven't paid that much attention before and then right. get dumbfounded by it, uh, change your mind on things publicly, stuff theologians are not supposed to do. You're not supposed to take after you get a position to teach your tradition yeah. so seriously that you dramatically change. That yeah. would show that you were never a real theologian, you know, because we once once you become <laughs> one, you don't have to change your mind. That's why it's called systematic theology. Uh-huh, um, yes. uh, can, can you uh, it's safe for us because uh, the joke. The joke that I yeah. tell people is that if you hate systematic religion, you'll love Judaism. <laughs> All right? Yeah. we are we are definitely not an organized religion. Well, w- one of the things that uh, that I really appreciated in the way you've kind of shared it is um, culturally, there's an interest in uh, mysticism. Yes. Um, and kind of non-dual spirituality and things like that. And for process people who uh, creativity is not God, we're all excited about um, learning to cultivate, um, uh, uh, seeking enlightenment and this type of thing related to creativity. And that's different than the salvation of God. Um, the different ultimates in Whitehead's uh, thought. Uh, yeah. and, and that's kind of how... Uh, you know, some Protestant process people deal with it. What I find so amazing by yours is you have this engaging 
in the kind of cultural interest in mysticism and doing it through the super kind of particularist Jewish expression of mysticism. So maybe you could tell us what the Zohar is and kind of like a moment or two in it where you your, your jaw kind of drops and the veil gets pulled sure. back and uh, sure. and just entice us after we finish the Rose, Rosenzweig reader to, uh, to to hang out with the Zohar. Yeah, the Rosenzweig reader is a tough read. Let, let me just, you know, twice you've now talked about super particularistic. And I don't know what that means. Oh, I, so um, um, let's say you uh, you asked me the question on your most recent uh, podcast on like the joy of being Jewish. Yes. And you tell the story like tearjerker about the regular blessing of your children and how it is a ritual for generation upon generation to bless your children, the shape yeah. it took in your own. If you were to ask a Christian minister about what they like, they would have said something so generic that every person in the room would say, Oh, you like loving our neighbor. Really? Come on, Christians. Like we would yeah. not want to say, uh, 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 handing the, the, our partner in life who we harm this week, the Eucharist. Like I we'd see. rarely pick these so things that. So, so one of the things that is beautiful, I mean, I guess I wouldn't call it particular. Maybe I'm responding to the language that's often used as a way to marginalize or to put down. I know you don't mean it that way. But calling a Jew particularist is a way of saying you don't really belong. So I may be responding. Oh, okay. Yeah, to yeah. I meant it in the standing behind you. Um, I meant it more there. in the that super like that. I wish Christians were more at home in the particularities of our Me tradition. And, and I think that's part of what will heal the false universalism yes. of some Christianities. Right? Is that to be able to say I'm in the flow, right? And to be in the flow of my wisdom tradition doesn't pass judgment on other wisdom traditions. It means I am who I am. I'm a real, actual, concrete person, mm -hmm. right? So um, for me, absolutely, the path of mitzvot, of living the commandments, is not burdensome. It's joyous. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it festoons my life with moments of holiness all day long, right? And that's true. And I love, I love the fact that for Jews, their family memories and their ethnic memories and their moral values and their personal identity are all fused in this great big stew of, of Jewishness, Judaism, right? Absolutely. So the Zohar, Jewish mysticism is not really marginal to Judaism, although in modern Judaism, it became somewhat marginalized mm -hmm. in part because of its excesses. But our age has learned the excesses of cold rationalism. And so for the last 30, 40 years, we've been kind of regathering the integration of emotion and intellect and, and that that's a healthier way to live as a human being. Well, the Zohar is the book of Jewish yearning and Jewish tears, right? The central metaphor of the Zohar is that God created a world that could not hold the divine energy, and so the divine vessels shattered. Mm -hmm. And the lost divine energy that spilled out created what we perceive as evil. The Zohar calls that the Sitra Achra, the other side. Um, and, and that Shekhinah, the female indwelling presence of the divine, broke away from the rest of the divine, only to be reunited by our good deeds and by the Sabbath. So once a week, she's reunited with God, and the divine energy can flow down and up. And God needs us to spend the week gathering lost sparks to be able to return them to their divine source. And in return for that, when we do that, then on Shabbat, divine shefa, divine energy flows to us. Now, I think that's as powerful a metaphor as I've ever heard for the indispensability of relationship. Mm -hmm. and for the indispensability of of looking out for each other and doing each other's work together. Um, I love the idea of a God in exile. I think that's actually Judaism's equivalent of a crucified God. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to understand that the divine is also imperfectly perceived. So what that breaks is the idea that whatever happens is happening because God wants it. Because the Zohar tells us flat out he's in exile. This is not the world God ultimately dreams of. Mm -hmm. um, but it also empowers us to have a role. 
God cannot gather the sparks. We have to gather the sparks. And so all of us, by living lives of holiness and goodness, we spend the week collecting sparks, which then on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, can be returned to God. I love that. The other thing about the Zohar I just want to throw in there, I know I've said a lot, is it's one of the few books I know in Western tradition that takes seriously God's female side, mm-hmm. right? God is multi-gendered in the Zohar, right? So, of course, there's a ton of male imagery, God the king, God the sovereign, whatever. But there are two places, both Shekhinah and Bina, which is the upper mother, where God's female attributes are central to God's nature. And the flow and the give and take between God's male attributes and female attributes are the entire dynamism of the Zohar. And I think that's also profoundly healing, given that both of us are located in traditions that have historically marginalized the female, um, almost to the point of invisibility. The Zohar, surprisingly, in the medieval period, throws that aside and revels in the multi-gendered possibilities of the divine. Yeah. So when one of the things that I've noticed, Justin, in, in, in your book and in, uh, in, your, in your podcast is how sometimes hearing a Jewish exegete of a text that Christians all agree means X, Y, or Z, but A yeah. and B are not even on the table, right. uh, is one of those imagination explosions. Because if I tried to say what you said, they're like, yeah. oh, look at this heretical minister trying to blah, blah, blah. But if you say it, you're like, actually, this is kind of what we were thinking it meant way before y'all sure. existed. Uh, <laughs> Gentiles, if you've uh, uh, wanted yes. to spend any time, even in your New Testament, it's packed full of, I don't know, Jews. So right. Right. Uh, we, when you think back to uh, some of those texts where you w- want to just like hit pause on all, all the Christians for a while and go, ah, could you please um, just sit long enough to hear an interpretation or reading that's so unlike yours, your theology might not be as uh, problematic in its relationship to uh, other faiths and to the Jewish people if you if you just you know, unclogged your ears a little bit. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, I can think of ones that you've talked about, but I'm interested when you're engaging in kind of interreligious dialogue, how um, you could uh, – what text do you wish um, – we had different interpretive resources on the table for. Well, look, I mean, the the, the ones that I get hit with on airplanes is <laughs> is Isaiah, right? And specifically the suffering servant stuff. Mm-hmm. And the challenge is, I think it's it's the right of a Christian to read the Hebrew Bible in the light of their own scripture. Like, I don't think that's an illegitimate hermeneutical move. But the place where I think Christianity has made an error in the past is to assume that's the only meaning of the scripture and even its primary meaning. See, that's where the distinction between pshat, the contextual meaning, and drash, the interpretive meaning, helps. Because it's a perfectly fair move to say as a midrash that Isaiah's suffering servant, we hear as Jesus. Okay, that's your right to do. But the pshat of Isaiah, it is certainly not Jesus who's intended. And that always feels like an act of theft to me. Like, you know, the plain meaning of scripture is so clear and it gets taken away from us. So um, so that whole cluster of areas, I thought if, if Christians could distinguish between pshat mm-hmm. and drash, that would make my life better. And I think it would also then open Christianity to say, okay, then if that's the distinction we're making, we need to agree on what the pshat is. Yeah. Like, what did it mean when Isaiah said it? But then there's a possibility of multiple midrashim. So here's how we interpret it. Tell us how you interpret it. And then the verse starts to take on multiple meanings and it really glows. Mm-hmm. Well, that I, I think that's really helpful. And one of the one of the other questions I had, and it comes up in um, in, your, in your book, is how how Christians have reread our Genesis one through eleven, kind of this shared universal history. Before you get the kind of subversive covenant particularity choosing of divine investment in, in Abraham, uh, yeah. and and we frame the entire biblical narrative and everything on uh, Genesis one through eleven. 
and then it gets it you know it gets reuniversalized again with Jesus kind of thing. Um, right. And I remember one time you said, "Well, uh, uh, you know, uh, Exodus is our origin story, and right. Um, right. and then these other things <laughs> uh, come after." Right. Can you can you kind of say how how you read Genesis one through eleven at, at, with the Exodus being? Uh, the origin story and that, uh, that these, uh, universal kind of yeah. myths are, are, uh, filling in the gaps versus setting the stage. Yes. So I just got to say though, Trip, I'm still uncomfortable with the way you throw around universal in particular. And that could be me. I don't think that the universal is the first part of Genesis and then it becomes universal again with Jesus because Jesus is fairly particular. Oh, yeah. 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 And, Christians are a particular bunch of folk. Oh, so, I, I was mostly thinking that, like in uh, in Acts, when there's the big argument about letting in the Gentiles, yes. uh, or without getting snipped, um, the the agreement is like the covenant of Noah, because up to that point, God's dealing with all yeah. of us. But um, I understand. All I want to say is that's a new form of particularism, mm-hmm. right? It's not universal, and to 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 hold it out that way is to perpetuate. I think a a, a way of seeing it that's harmful to Christianity too. Okay. So we all have our own particularisms. There's no way to get out of particular. Whitehead says the only thing that's concrete is the real, right? Um, so the way I would see it, I mean, and the other thing I just need to remind you is that the first 11 chapters of Genesis, while they purport to be about the world as a whole, are given in Hebrew, mm-hmm. right? So that it's a Jewish telling of a universal story. Um, and the story's culmination is in the patriarchs, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's a circling in that says that if you're concerned about the world, you can only be concerned about particular individuals, right? The way I would say that is you can't love trees in the abstract. Like if you don't love particular trees, then you actually don't love trees. And if right. you don't love a particular mountain, you can't love mountains, Right. So for Jews, just again to reframe it, um, our love of the land of Israel is how we learn how to love the whole planet. Mm-hmm. Someone who loves the whole planet abstractly, it, I just don't think that's a real love of the planet. Um, so, so for, for me, the way I would frame it is I think that the Bible starts twice. The creation story in Genesis and in Psalms and in Job. Um, those stories locate our relationship to the rest of creation and to the planet as a whole. Um, and then the Exodus story locates our relationship in the context of an urge towards liberty and towards freedom. And both of those stories, interestingly enough, are the core values of Judaism. So almost every liturgical moment is... Zecher l'masev reishit, in memory of the acts of creation, and Zecher yitziat mitzrayim, and in memory of leaving Egypt. So when we say the blessing over the wine on Friday night for Shabbat, it's in memory of creation and in memory of the exodus from Egypt. Both of those events fill out and round out the nature of our relationship to God, which is through the natural order and through the undying yearning for human dignity and liberation. Um, and I think it's not a coincidence that those are the two grand stories of the Bible, and that in some sense the rest of the Bible is itself just a midrash on Genesis and Exodus. Mm-hmm. So how would you uh, give us some uh, insight into this kind of drive to read Genesis 3 uh, as clearly explaining some Christian doctrine of sin? Um because uh, the it's, it, a lot of times when you're Protestants do theology, you would think the, that uh, the whole story begins with uh, Genesis three, um, right. and uh, and then what what the 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 system of a, of atonement and the temple practice, all this kind of stuff, um, are, are really are there to set up for something else. How yes. would that story? How do you see the story of God's relationship to individuals and the community and the planet? This sin and redemption, exile, return, um, enslavement and liberation. How do you tell that redemptive relationship of God outside of any us appropriating it for our own uh, story so, later? So. Um Two thoughts. One is you have as much right to appropriate it as we do. Mm-hmm. 
Um, it's out there. Um, but again, it's the, the unwillingness to distinguish pshat and drash that becomes problematic because then what, what Christianity has often said traditionally is no, the real meaning of Genesis and the real meaning of Leviticus is the precursor to Christ. Right. And I think that comes about because we've used the same word and mean something different by it. The word teshuva, the word repentance, for a Jew means recognizing the error of my ways and regretting it. And the minute we do that, the Bible says what we need to do is confess our sin and turn back to God. But then we're done. Like, that's it, that we're done, right? You know, you... You, you realize that what you did was an error. You, you admit that it was an error. You make, you confess to the person you sinned against. You try to make it right. And then you turn to God and say, forgive me, Lord. And God does. The sacrifice happens after that, right? The sacrifice doesn't do the work of repentance. It marks the work of repentance, which is why for us, the destruction of the temple while a tragedy is not especially significant. Um, but because for Christianity, repentance became I accept the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. That then throws back, if you don't have personal repentance, meaning, I'm sorry, I won't do it again, and then God says, okay, then you have to have Jesus' crucifixion, and that becomes, in some sense, more important than Jesus' teachings, or at least that's how it looks to this Jew. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, but, But you don't have to read the Bible that way, right? So it's entirely plausible to read the Bible as... What Adam and Eve did um, that was the sin was given everything they wanted more. And they they sundered their relationship with God and with each other for the sake of that fruit, right? Um, And their being kicked out of the garden was partly consequence, but it was also partly what it took for them to grow up. Right. It's like sending your teenage child out into the world. Right. They can't live in their parents home forever without being infantilized forever. And no parent should want that for their children. You want your kids to go out in the world and and they're going to suffer bumps and hurts and they're going to make mistakes. So in a sense, we see God sending Adam and Eve out of the garden as saying, all right, kids, time to grow up, time to make your own choices. And that gets replicated. We build a temple. Because everyone has a temple that sacrifices, so we think we need it too. Um, but at some point, we outgrow it. And so God allows it to be taken away from us to, to let us know you don't need this building anymore. You can repent simply by turning to me wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. And if you do that, you're done. That's enough. But also then, here's a parting of the ways comment. Because it's sufficient for a Jew simply to turn back to God, we don't need someone's atoning death, mm-hmm. right? It's just unnecessary. It's, it's you know, okay, if that's what he wants to do, but it doesn't touch me any. Um, whereas I think for many strains of Christianity, again, the elevation of the crucifixion and resurrection above and beyond any particular teaching of Jesus, um, that forced that reading of Genesis 1 through 3 that I just think, it, it sucks the air out of the story, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think it does It does credit to Genesis, and it makes for a much less interesting read um, if all you're doing is waiting for the second session, second season to start, um, you know? And, and it also then doesn't make sense of human autonomy and human capacity to be responsible for our actions and for God to meet us in the concrete nature of our deeds. What if instead of seeing Jesus as the one who does it for us, um, you know, I love the way John Cobb um, treats Jesus as his Rebbe, mm-hmm. right? Jesus is not the one who did it so that I don't have to. I can just like plug on to him. Jesus is the one who shows me that I can do it too. I You don't have to persuade me to love John Cobb. That's, that's one of my uh, uh, hobbies. Good. Good. Um, yes, all of us. Yeah, but the uh, one of the one of the other questions that I, I, I had was, how as a, a as a leader for conservative Judaism, do you see the changing relationship or understanding of Jewish identity as a, as an ethnic group, a political constituency, a, a, a religion? Um, what is it like to try to negotiate that 
in a culture that has impacted even Jews in the same way it's impacted Christians to sure. want uh, want some of the perks without any uh, particular affirmations. So look, the challenge that we face is that the categories you raised, people, religion, polity, those are all Anglo-Saxon terms in English to describe very accurately the experience of people from Western Europe. Mm -hmm. And they become less accurate the further you get from Western Europe, right? So you can locate a European as my ancestors were Saxon and I'm a member of the Church of England and I come from wherever, right? You can do, and all of those categories neatly fit into that life and that history. They don't really work for us, right? So Judaism has many of the traits of a religion, but you can be an atheist and you're still a Jew. Mm -hmm. You're 100% a Jew. And you can say, oh, it's all nonsense. I don't do any of it, right? Um, you can be born Anglo-Saxon Protestant and say, I'm adopting the Jewish religion. And then you're 100% a Jew, even though your ancestors were still Anglo-Saxon, right? So we don't really fit the categories of the West. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with that. Um, you know, the Torah calls us an Am, right, which loosely translates a people, but it, it's a Hebrew term. It has its own valence. So Judaism is a nexus of history, religion, peoplehood, um, culture, shared destiny, um, all of those things together. And the excitement and the challenge of contemporary life in America is... I think in some ways ethnicity rose again in the 70s and 60s, but for a lot of our people, it's not a driving force now. And I'm okay with that um, because I think I'm okay with Judaism being seen more as a wisdom tradition. Mm -hmm. um, but that wisdom tradition includes a healthy regard for shared heritage and shared destiny, um, which means that we have... We have the quirky traits of a people, too. You know, we have a disproportionate caring for the land of Israel and what happens there. And that's weird, but it's us. And, you know, we have certain foods that we like and dislike, and that's us. And for all the anti-Semitic overtones, we do have certain ways of talking and certain kinds of humor. And, like, all, all of that, that is, it, there it is. Um, and people can join us. So I think for Jews, it's actually healing for us to focus on the wisdom of our tradition rather than just on shtick and humor and whatever. Um, and the ongoing challenge for our non-Jewish friends is to use our refusal to let go of our ethnic particularities as an invitation to celebrate your own. Yeah. So how how do you negotiate that? And you were asked it recently on um, one of the podcasts, uh, for things like, uh, um, marriages for people that are coming from different religious, uh, traditions, one's Jewish, one's not, or, uh, and that kind of thing. What would it mean when you give this, uh, uh, you know, articulation of, well, Jewish weddings involve Jews, um, and, but you give it in this very generous open way that to a lot of kind of Christian boundary markers, the way we frame things that didn't compute. Um, can you right. kind of say what is it like to think pastorally about these identity questions when yeah. Western Anglo definitions and boundaries aren't the ones we're using for defining religion and community? Sure. So, so look, if um, the first thing is to meet people in a place of honor and love, Right. So even if people are wanting to enter into marriages that I can't consecrate, that doesn't mean, A, they shouldn't legally get to do it, and it doesn't mean I shouldn't honor their choices. Um, there are lots of motivations for why people marry the people that they may they do, and it's not my business to sit in judgment of them <clears throat> or to tell them not to, but it is my business to tell them some of the consequences of those choices. The Jews are a small minority. And if Jews continue to marry non-Jews, I mean, I'll give you the latest statistic. The, the odds of someone marrying a non-Jew and having a Jewish grandchild is 7%, right? And that's because y'all are cute, you know, and you're actually kind of nice to hang out with. And, and this is the first time we live in a country where people think we're hot, um, so, 
Um, you know, and I, I don't want to get into an argument about that. Um, it does surprise me somewhat. I think knowing Jews would help cure that a bit. But but we're a hot commodity. People like to have us as husbands and even as wives. And um, and so some people are going to choose their personal happiness. And because they were raised in a way that's not particularly distinctively Jewish, who they are is totally at home in the general culture. And so it's a reasonable and healthy choice for them to say, Jewish has never been my primary definition, and so it's not going to be now. Okay, that doesn't mean they're self-hating. It doesn't mean they despise the tradition. But it does have a consequence. The consequence is it's much harder to raise kids who identify as Jewish if the adults in the household don't. And so um, I think, I continue to think, that the effort of the rabbis should be to throw as wide an encompassing embrace as possible, show people that Judaism is a wise and beautiful way to live, and let people know that we are actively open to helping people convert and join the Jewish people without being proselytizing. It's not about saving your souls. It's if you find yourself at home in this path, that's great. We'll help you do that. Um, and then I, but for me as a rabbi, my work is to advance the covenant. And I don't believe that is served by my officiating when someone at the wedding would be an outsider. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, what I encourage them to do is get married with the justice of the peace and then come study Judaism and see if that's a possibility. And at the point where both of them are inside, that's the time to have rabbinic officiation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I, I really, I I know people that if this is the first time they've encountered you, then that you should just go get your podcast, go to the Facebook page, Rabbi Artson, and um, check out your books. You have a new one coming out. Do you want to say something about that? Sure, I'm very excited about the new one. I hope to do a trilogy of creation, revelation, and redemption. Mm-hmm. So this is the creation book. It's called Renewing the Process of Creation. And it's looking at how you can take science seriously and how you can take religion seriously, obviously from a process perspective. But it's got a lot of great takes on the Bible and particularly on the creation story. And a lot of ways, uh, there's some awesome, cool science. Can I leave you with an interesting science thing I just learned oh, yeah, this week? Definitely. All right. So, so this is something I read about dung beetles. Um, and your listeners should know that dung beetles are exactly what they sound like. They're <laughs> beetles who like to eat poop, and they roll it into little tiny balls, and then they roll those balls to where they'll remember to get them later. It's like, you know, s- dinner storage, delicious. Um, and scientists wanted to know how dung beetles know where to roll the poop that they've made little balls out of. And they discovered that the beetles track the stars. So if you put the beetles in a dark room and you put lights in the ceiling, they can roll their poop balls in straight lines. And if you turn off the lights, then they start just rolling randomly. That to me is an example of a level of mindfulness that pervades creation far in excess of what we ever expected. Mm -hmm. Right? The universe is magical. The universe is marvelous. Um, The universe is supernatural. And and to be able to know that you don't need to have recourse to supernatural because nature itself is so super that that we're still exploring the ways that mind and consciousness permeate everything. Mm -hmm. Um, To my mind, that's religiously significant. And so the book talks about things like that. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to reading it, and uh, it's been a complete joy to get to talk to you, um, and not you. just not just hear you in my earbuds while I do dishes. Um, so, uh, thank you so much for what you do, and hopefully, uh, we'll get to do this again. And uh, and and here's here's my goal. My new goal for the next year is to uh, record you and John Cobb talking together, and, That'd be awesome. and I'm just gonna watch. But, That'd be great. I'd love that. But that that would be three, totally wonderful. Three way conversation. Great. Excellent. All right. I hope you have a great mo- the rest of your morning. Thank you. You too. And shalom to you and to all the listeners. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.